Did you want an overview of the entire process or did you just want the inception? Of the I don't story? even I remember, I but I enjoyed what you just it. said. <laughs> okay. I have a bad habit of just not shutting up. I will say that. That's, and I apologize. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. <laughs>
uh, very purposefully. I wanted a quick in and out. I wanted a school that was going to be hardcore because, you know, everything I had ever heard about the industry was how hardcore it was. So I didn't want something that was going to be chill. And that's kind of how I am. I like to go hard at things if I want to do something. Right. And so I really liked the idea that it was just this intense 24 seven school. That's all you did. And, you know, it was an in and out. And now I know where the buttons are. Like, that's really what I wanted. <laughs> You know, right. I didn't want to go to a school where people are telling me what a character is and, and you know, how to tell your themes and how to tell your mm. story. And it's like, OK, but I don't know. You know, even then, that was the thought process in my head is like, I don't know their work. I don't know yeah. if they know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? You know, right. this is what a story is, says who. So it was always the idea of I just want to know, you know, why the camera's reacting the light the way it is or isn't, how these colors go to get, you know, the, the practical elements of being able to, you know, intelligently uh, wield these you know, tools to do the things that I'll figure out on my own. I mean, now I just wouldn't have gone. I just would have done YouTube and I would have learned it all there. And there you go. You know, uh, you don't need it anymore if that's the route you want to take. I mean, film school is great if you want to go and create your network and just focus in on something, things like that. Uh, but if all you wanted was I wanted was a technical education, <laughs> you don't need to spend money for it anymore. Right. Uh, which is like, damn it. Come on. You yeah. know? Uh, <laughs> spent so much money. I was in debt for so long. Yeah. Then after that, I did like three jobs. I stocked shelves. I did, you know, tech support. I did uh, construction work. My dad, um, you know, is an electrical contractor. So I, I worked for him and so I just yep. did whatever I could to make money so I could finally start buying my own gear, which took quite a while. And I, I finally got frustrated and I, I sat down at uh, a Starbucks where my girlfriend, now wife, worked uh, and just drank free coffee for like three days straight, sending my resume <laughs> to, I, it was legit, like, over 150 places for sure maybe 200 oh, places man. um it took me three days to do it and one place got back to me one <laughs> one single place <laughs> and it was a production company that works with alienware alienware is the gaming division of dell and alienware was looking for a full-time video person but they were looking for somebody who was very specifically like me a jack of all trades which you know that was the one upside i had to to most anybody else is I could do, I can write it, I can shoot it, I can produce it, I can do the video effects, I can do the music, you know, so that got me that job. I did that for a while, which was, you know, very much talking heads and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. But it gave me a studio and gear to toy around with. And then I started working toward my first short film. And then finally, that gave me the idea for Film Riot. And, you know, the rest is uh, history, I suppose. <laughs> 13 year history. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, what What was that? Like a year into, uh, like after starting Film Riot, you talked about how you, you quit your job, I'm assuming at Alienware, and you were living on a friend's couch or a friend's futon. Uh, yeah. While, while you, as you say, we're trying to figure all this out. There are only three reasons I can guess why somebody would make a move like that, because it's totally a move that I would make. Um, but it's either you're just flat out determined to make it work. You're at the point where you're desperate to make it work because you're tired of working for somebody else. Or you're just actually that confident that you can make it work. What? Where was your head at when you made that decision? All of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, it was, you know, I had been doing film right for a year while doing this full time job and the full time job. It was kind of cool at first and it was always great The people I worked worked with were always wonderful but you know when things started shit like Dell really took it over and things started shifting so they really downsized what the video and photo team did they you know mm. they let go almost everyone but me so that just kept going and uh you know what what my department did you know, reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced until it was like, it was really soul sucking for me, <laughs> you know, which, <laughs> yeah. you know, that stuff is for everyone. I was lucky to have a job and I was very appreciative of that job. But, um, you know, I was also doing full film riot full time, but that wasn't even remotely enough money to pay the bills. It was borderline no money. It was really an investment. I had to decide, am I going to keep going on this and film riots eventually going to fail because it's not sustainable? Or do I just jump out of the plane and hope this untested parachute opens? Right. Uh, so I just decided to bet on myself. And initially the plan was I was going to leave my apartment. Um, 
with my my roommate and I was just going to live out of my car, which I set up my trunk to be. I had already set it up. I figured it out. I got boxes and they were open. So it was going to be like a dresser, basically. Nice. <laughs> and I was going to put what I could not I was going to put in my parents house and then the rest I was going to do in there. And I wasn't really going to tell them why, because I didn't want them to because they would have let me move back. They're really awesome like that. But you know, that would have been comfortable. And if I got comfortable, I felt like, you know, things would also fall apart. Like that's kind right. of all, always been my motto is to make myself uncomfortable to some degree. Cause if you get comfy, you know, you don't want to get up and, uh, you know, but if you're always uncomfortable, you'll always move, you know, Sentinel's a good example of that. Sentinel was paint by numbers for me. It was like, yeah, I, I can do that in my sleep. I know how to make this. I've, I've made stuff like this. I'm not nervous about this at all. So right. I decided to not write a script and not do a, a, a shot list, hardly even think about it before we showed up on the location, which I had never seen before. And so, which we, so we had bullet point, I had bullet points of like, okay, here's generally what I want to happen. And I just made it up as we went. And, and, you know, the, obviously the location doesn't fully work. So I'm using this space and that space over there to look like they're right next to each other. And I got to make sure all the screen direction is correct. And, and now I'm uncomfortable, you know, right. so it's just finding ways to make it a little nerve wracking, you know, cause it just keeps me sharp. So, you know, I was just going <laughs> to live out of my car for a bit, but then my friend got <laughs> wind of that and he's like, well, I'm going to get an apartment soon. You want to just sleep on my futon <laughs> at my parents' house? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> so I slept on his futon there for a bit. Then he got the apartment and then he let me live with him uh, for a little while, not paying rent because I didn't have money. <laughs> right. so, so, you know, that was uncomfortable in that he made me very comfortable and he was, uh, you know, uh, totally generous and, and, and happy to have me there. But it's like, you know, I still felt like, a, you know, a burden. Uh, right. So yeah. just, you know, everything, what can I do to make this not a thing anymore? Plus I wanted to marry my girlfriend and, right. <laughs> you know, I was like 28 at that point, 27 at that point, something like that, 27, mm -hmm. I think. So, you know, it's like, how do I make these things happen? So, you know, it just made me hustle uh, quite a bit. So I did some client stuff on the side, including, you know, on top of Film Riot, started another show called uh, Film State, you know, things like that. Um, to help grow it, push it uh, past the, you know, those, those boundaries until it finally became self-sustainable. And then, you know, I got married and on it went. I know that like when Film Riot started and also in your early short films, you were, you were basically, I mean, you were that jack of all trades that you were talking about earlier, I mean, right. the writer, director, editor. Um, but I, I know as time has gone on, you've passed off a lot of those hats and, and mm -hmm. in your last couple short films, um, ballistic. And, uh, I, I think also in there comes a knocking, you've basically solely been writer director. How hard was it to start passing off those, those different jobs in the beginning? What was the hardest one to give up? Um, none of them were <laughs> hard to give up. It was always, it was all glorious. It was right. all wonderful. Um, <laughs> Ballistic, I was executive producer, producer, writer, director on, um, and there comes a knocking. I was just like, you know, the studio and writer, director. Right. I bring that up because uh, Ballistic, I had great producers on it. I could not have done that without the help that they gave me. Not possible. Mm -hmm. And my brother, Tim, helps me produce pretty much everything I make as well. But, you know, uh, Ballistic was a really complicated short film for the money that we had, uh, the size of, you know, crew we had, or, you know, behind the scenes, the size of size of, you know, managerial positions to really wrangle this thing together. This is, you know, crazy complex beast. So I was producing on that as well. And it's just, it's a lot. It is so much. And you're trying to write this thing. And when you're writing, you're always writing until you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and you're directing this thing. And when you're directing, you're always directing until you hit upload. Right. Um, so, you know, there's, there's these creative hats that are going and then all of a sudden you're problem solving. And, you know, as one of the kind of lead producers in a lot of ways, there were times that nobody knew about certain issues, but me, but I'm the director, you know, and we're in the <laughs> middle of the most complex sequence of the whole shoot. And there are problems that only I know about. So I'm trying to solve those problems in the back of my mind while also solving the directorial problems of this scene no longer works. And I have to reposition eight cameras for this very complicated action sequence 
where it's shot in two different locations, but I got to all make it seamlessly tie together. And there's a mm-hmm. practical burn wire work an explosion. Okay. <laughs> you know, right. so these two, you know, parts of my brain are working same time and it's just very, very difficult, exhausting. And, you know, it takes a toll on the creative for sure. You know, which of course my producers helped with, you know, 99 percent of it but there are those little things that you know i wasn't able to quite pass off i had handled those things and then when there comes a knocking i was really set on i want to push all producing work away they're Mm -hmm. doing it the second we get to a point i shut it off completely i am just a writer director now and right man it was so great it was one of the smoothest easiest (laughs) shoots i've ever had and and before that it was years and years and years of me doing everything myself. And, and, you know, when you, I'm sure, you know, when you DP and cam op and direct the whole thing, mm-hmm. you know, your things are struggling, you know, nothing's firing on all cylinders because, you know, you're split between the different parts of you. I'm a confident editor. I really like editing and I definitely could, you know, do my own edits, but, um, you know, my editor, Lucas Harger is a much better editor. That's right. the one that I thought was going to be tough to let go. That is the one position that I thought I was going to have a really hard time letting it go. And so uh-huh. I was really nervous about it. A director friend of mine had been like bugging me about like, you need an editor, you need an editor, you need an editor. <laughs> um, and I'm like, are you saying I'm a bad editor? Like what's right. happening? <laughs> um, so I finally listened to him on this one, especially because we were going to have eight cameras for the biggest moment, you know, uh, and, and four cameras on the norm, three or four cameras on the norm. I think it was three. So it was going to be so much footage to wrangle. And, you know, we had deadlines. So I was like, man, I, I actually can't physically cannot do this myself. Um, so I was kind of forced into finally trying it. And it was immediate that I was in love with that process because you remove yourself completely um, and you become a director and a spectator. It's, you, you know, it's akin to acting and directing it. You can't really direct yourself if you're acting and you can't really direct yourself as an editor fully. And, you know, when you've done all you know, the minutia of this, cutting this sequence together, then you have all the technical knowledge of how it was pieced together. So you can't fully look at it objectively. Right. Um, and, and the other great thing about it is while Lucas would be cutting something, I'm looking at that. I'm looking what he's doing. I'm like, Hey, try this, try that, try this. And I'm also thinking about the next scene and the scene before it. Whereas when you're editing, you're kind of focusing right here in this moment. <clears throat> cut by cut. Yeah. Right. But while he's cutting, I'm thinking of the whole and I'm, I'm thinking about, OK, is this working? How is this working? What's working? What's not working about this moment that he's currently cutting? But I'm freed up to while he's doing the little shifts or whatever, while he's doing technical things to now think of my story as a whole, to think the scene before and after it, to think about this character's arc and how does this fit in the greater whole? So now I'm really directing the piece and not, you know, being bogged down by the technical. So it I I was finally like, okay, I text my friend. I'm like, all right, I get it. I get why you've been saying that. So (laughs) that one was tough in theory to give up until the first day that uh that lucas was cutting and i was like oh oh no this is great too (laughs) so it's like everything that i've given up released me to do the thing that i really love which is you know directing and telling you know helping mold and tell this story steer it in the direction that the story wants to go yeah it's uh it's uh, i started off as an editor and i'm now kind of trying to get into more of the director writer and 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 i know exactly what you're saying like when you're editing something and i I find this even you know with the little sketches that i make for another series on my channel it's really hard actually i I don't even think it's possible like i cannot have like director brain and editor brain at the same time yeah but i i love doing all that like the jack of all trades aspect is perfect for a director um you should try to put in the work to understand all the positions you're going to directly be influencing Um, yeah you know so one so you can have a handle on the story that you're telling and more importantly so you can take care of your people and you know treat them with respect because it's like how can you really fully respect and appreciate someone if you don't understand what they do or who they are or you know like another culture if you don't understand that culture it's not like you just meant to be offensive just now you didn't know yeah. But you didn't put in the work to know. So it's still on you. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, you know, I think a director needs to put in the work to know 
um, so he can, you know, treat his his cast and crew appropriately. I 100 percent agree. You seem to have always approached YouTube a lot differently than most people on YouTube, uh, even people in, in the filmmaking space who kind of treat YouTube as like a social media platform where they upload stuff that they want to share. But it, it seems right. like you've almost treated YouTube like like a streaming network, like Netflix or mm -hmm. Hulu or something like that. And Film Riot is a show that you're producing for that network. I mean, you've even gone so far as to have, I mean, you had Revision 3 producing the show for a little bit. Yep. What, what was your mentality? Like, why did you decide to approach it in that way instead of it just being like, okay, here's my YouTube channel? I had tried every platform I could find. If something popped up, I would post to it just, you know, here's somewhere where I could use as like a stage. Will this work? No. Will this work? No. No one cares. Will this work? No. No one cares. YouTube was the first one that I had posted and it found an audience. So he put stuff up and then, you know, Rev3 got wind of it. And Rev3 Rev had their own streaming platform, like their own, like, this is us Netflix. We're Netflix. Here's our Netflix thing. Right. Um, and that removed it from that public space for me. Now it was like, you know, it was like Netflix. You don't have a comment section on Netflix. I can't see how many views they're getting. I'm totally disconnected from my audience now. So now it's all just going to Netflix and nothing's going to YouTube. And mm -hmm. I hated it. I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed for it to be uploaded to both that we're, you know, we're missing out on YouTube is where I can interact with the audience that where they can feel like they're watching it with me. Even they finally did it. Uh, and, and then that's where I focused all my attention because it's, you know, for me, it was a streamer, but one that's direct connect to the audience. So mm -hmm. it was like, as if I had always, in, I, for me, it was always like this digital movie theater, you know, where we just played here, we're going to play stuff and we're actually here. We're not always in the theater with you, but we're over here by the concession stands. Come by and say hi. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. That's kind of in my mind, the digital version of that. And I just loved that aspect of it. And for me, I don't have a ton of interest in, you know, if we're going to do something that's vlog ish, it's not going to be straight up vlog. It's going to be vlog ish. And it's going to be because, yes, that makes sense for that. Right. I'm not going to vlog my friggin' life. Like, I don't, nobody cares that I'm eating, drinking coffee. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, it's coffee. You're right. I don't care. You no. don't care. No one cares. You know? <laughs> and there's a lot of people who do vlogs like that, that I'm very entertained by. They have very entertaining lives. They're very charismatic with that. That's not me. I wake up in the morning and I hate everything until I drink my coffee. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? For me, the presentation um, the, the, the closer to a filmic sort of traditional presentation has always been more my thing. You know, we definitely have our style and we definitely have our format now for sure. But whenever the wind takes us, we do that instead right. uh, because we can. Um, and that's what I really loved about it is, you know, if we went to like a traditional streamer, which we definitely would with the right thing, um, we're beholden to them and we have to deliver on what this is and these standards and blah, blah, blah. We're going to do an episode coming soon where we're going to shoot the whole thing on VHS and VHSC cameras like I did when I was a kid. You know? Nice. You know, could you do that elsewhere? Probably not. <laughs> right. But we want to. So we're going to, you know. Um, so that's the beauty of it, of of like why I, I love YouTube so much. And YouTube can be extremely frustrating, too, you know, at the mm -hmm. same time. You know, I'm not going to just sing YouTube's praises only like their algorithms and <clears throat> how one episode will do gangbusters and the very next episode is throttled and you're like, I'm sorry, you're going to send this to the people who click the bell or not, <laughs> you know, but YouTube would never go away because it's just the same thing with revision. The, what happened when I was with revision three, it's just that direct connect to an audience to see the reaction, you know, uh, to hear the feedback, to respond to as little as just being able to thank them directly for watching and, and saying what they said or whatever it is. Um, We'll, we'll never let that go, I don't think. And it's just, it's such an interesting platform to release, you know, come into our digital living room. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I love that aspect of it. Something that has always struck me about your short films, especially since you put them on YouTube, is that they are made so much differently than a lot of what you find when you search for short film on YouTube. 
uh, which half the time, and I'm not knocking this by the way, because because it, it's it, it most of them look you know ninety times better than what the stuff that I can put out. But a lot of times when you search short film on YouTube, what you end up with is a, a whole bunch of basically uh, montages on top of some music from the cinematic category on Epidemic Sound, right? Which which is fine, you know. Um, <laughs> right. But you know, in comes Ryan. <laughs> with <laughs> crews and lighting and you know it it's being fully produced by an entire team of people and i i want it like what how does that happen like when when uh, you've come up with your idea like where where do you go from there from a story standpoint of how I, how one is put together and how i tell it it's kind of always a little bit different. And a lot of with uh, my short films, it either popped up with something that just all of a sudden I'm like, I want to do this. Okay, going to do it now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, oftentimes to my older brother's, you know, dismay, because it would be like all of a sudden the trains, the trains moving toward making this thing. And I'm in, and I'm just like, you know, a kid with a new toy. And I'm just going toward it. And he's like, dude, you're saying you want to do that in a month. Are you nuts? You know, uh, and, and he helps keep everything in check and keeps the train from going off the rails. But they're all a little bit different and they're mostly made up like, like take proximity. I'll try to go through a couple pretty quickly. Take proximity. Originally, that was going to be a $300,000 short film called Outsiders. Mm -hmm. It completely fell through last minute. So I didn't have anything. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any of the props or the anything that we had. We had of some wardrobe that we had bought and we had weathered because we were going to use it for this and that. I had a single camera borrowed from a friend that was there uh, and a couple of friends, one of which was going to be doing BTS, which was Justin Robinson. He was right. going to be coming doing BTS for the other thing. And I'm like, well, you look really cool. So now you're in it. Yeah. It turns out he's an amazing actor. Right. <laughs> uh, and I had Josh and Todd. OK, so what can I do with this? You know, and, you know, because it was very much a full blown screw it. You know, I'm you know, we just failed miserably and I'm flat on my face and depressed. Am I going to practice what I preach or not? And Daniel James really encouraged me and was very, it was a very tough lovey. It was like, shut up, stop whining, practice what you preach. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Let's practice what we <laughs> preach. Yeah. So in <clears throat> the total of 10 days, came up with a new idea that could be done for $300. Yeah. Seth Worley and I wrote it. And then in five days, we shot out the whole thing uh, with next to no crew. So it was like, what could we do? So it was very much like, okay, this one person had emailed me a couple months back, said they had 300 acres. I wonder what that looks like. Okay, here's what it looks like. Okay, what could be happening there? Maybe there's an alien thing. Maybe this guy wakes up in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't know how he's there, but what's happening? Maybe it's a multidimensional thing. No, let's say, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Oh, <laughs> my friend, he could make a sci-fi device. Oh, what if it's two people and they, they're like shackled together? Oh, what if they're not like visibly shackled together. What if it's a sci-fi? Oh, cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it became this, like, here's what we have. Here's what we can get. Uh, here's the clothes that we have. We literally don't even have money to buy more clothing for this. So let's use these. Let me look at them. Oh, okay. Oh, they're, they'll all be dressed like them. Cause we have all these, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that was like this project of, you know, very much of what do we have and the passion of, we just got punched in the gut Let's do it anyway, mm. um, which was really exciting and is my favorite experience to this day because of it. Because it was just such like, let's just get it done. Let's just go do it. Rally together. Like yeah. Filmmaking. After Outsiders had failed so hard, mm -hmm. it taught me so much. Like I didn't regret it at all because it really educated me. Yeah. So after that, I had this laundry list of what I didn't know. And now I knew. I'm like, okay. And I, you know, I promised myself this would not happen again. Right. Um, so here's what I don't know. And now I'm going to spend the next five years and I made myself a little five year plan. I'm going to spend the next five years educating myself. And then at the end of five years, I'm going for it. But that way I will have, <clears throat> I will have educated myself with the things I don't know. So at the end of those five years, I should be able to look somebody in the eyes and be like, you can bet on me. No problem. Nice. So then the next five years, all the shorts that I did were, you know, strategic decisions to to start, you know, checking those boxes. So DJI wanted me to do this like five part series of how to use their gimbals and whatnot. And I was like, 
No, but how about if I make five short action pieces and I use all your stuff and then we show how I used it. And they're like, okay. And so that's how those came about. And then, you know, um, UFO, yeah, was similar. I wanted to do something that was a little less shaky cam, run around, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to do something that was a bit slower, took its time a bit more, but also had a visual effect element. And I wanted to mess around with special effects makeup. And that's how UFO Yeah came to be. You know, that idea pop. Oh, you know what I, you know, it'd be fun and funny. And then we can do like this whole fat suit on Josh. And, and how long is that going to take? And what are going to be the, you know, the pitfalls to that? And okay, this digital element, but I want to add a practical. So now we're, you know, so it's adding all these things that I haven't done to figure out and learned a lot with the practical makeup and there was stuff in post that we had to do to tighten the makeup up. And, and, and so, okay, now I know all that, you know, so, and that's how everything has been. And, and, um, ballistic was really a big swing toward finishing it all off. Cause it was, it was implementing a few things that I had done before, but not quite at scale. Um, and then other things like we're going to light a dude on fire. <laughs> you know, we're going <laughs> right. to do practical explosions. I haven't done those before. Mm. You know, what are the safety measures? Who do we need there? Not only that, but, you know, we had one day that I had a hundred people on set. So now I am steering the ship of, you know, that size crew. But also I wanted to tell a multifaceted story, you know, a story that was action and thriller. And can I weave those two together? So it was also like, I want to challenge myself story wise. And I really love experimenting with not telling you anything while telling you something. Ballistic was a nice playing ground of all that stuff, you know, plus two different states we shot in, you know, two different crews, all these cameras. It was just a very, very big production yeah. with the most money I've ever dealt with. If it was a feature film that we actually paid for everything and didn't get like favors and freebies and <laughs> loans and uh it would have been i you know it would have been a multi-million dollar feature film with the way that we did it um so that was like a really good proving ground as well so so each short has had that inception of like what do i need to learn now you know what i mean because okay. i want to make feature films i don't want to make short films i love making short films but i want to make features i'm like this is not my end goal right you know so that's i don't know if that answered the question but that's kind of it's kind of a difficult question to answer like where does the idea come from where does the story start um it's it's a difficult thing to do but did, did you want an overview of the entire process or did you just want the inception of the i don't story? even I remember I but i enjoyed what you just it. said <laughs> okay i have a bad habit of just not shutting up i will say that That's, and i apologize i'm okay with that i'm okay <laughs> no but you did say something very very interesting um, about not telling everybody, you know, t not yeah. telling everything. Um, Cause that's one thing, one of the things that I've definitely noticed about your short films. And um, one of the things that I enjoy the most is that you give us just enough, like each one tells a story, but they also feel like they're part of a much larger yet to be told story, you know? And right. um, I mean, one that accomplishes a couple things. One, it, it lets me kind of imagine what that bigger story is, which then gets me more invested in the short film. Right. But it also seems like these could be almost like proofs of concept for a feature. Um, exactly. Is that part of why you do it the way you do it? Or is it just how yes. you like telling stories? Exactly. Um, so <clears throat> the like Sentinel proximity ballistic specifically is kind of dancing around the exact type of movie I'm dying to make. Okay. Um, and, you know, but every, every short film I do, uh, I mean, UFO, yeah, included, um, you know, I, that's not really a proof of concept for a film, but if you make a short film and it's completely buttoned up and there's nowhere to go, then there's nowhere to go. Right. But if you make a short film that can intrigue someone and they're like, oh, what's this? What's the feature version of this? That's what you want to <laughs> yes. do. Yes. You want to get a producer to say out loud. What's the feature version of this? If you have a perfectly buttoned up short film, then the producer is going to say, that was a really good short film. Right. Okay. That's it. Yeah. I see. That, that should have been a short film. It is a short film that is done. It is it's, that is its final form, a short film, mm. which if that's your intention, great. But especially in the landscape that we're in now, that's doesn't at least, you know, 
only in my perspective and you know it's different for everyone and everybody has a bit of a different path but it definitely seems like you need to intrigue, intrigue to the point of you know what's the feature version of this because if there's you know there's a ton of people trying to direct there's so many more than ever before <laughs> it's very difficult to break it's just oh next to impossible to break in it is more likely that you never will than you will mm -hmm. by far um so you really got to stack the chips in your favor of you have to be in ownership of something somebody else wants and then you shackle yourself to that thing. So if you want this, I come with it. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, again, that's the best way I, I could put it is what my thinking is, is when I make a short film, I want to entertain an audience. I want to, you know, I'm using it for all the things that I said. I'm using it to educate myself. I love giving an audience an experience. Like I want you to feel excited or laugh or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like that is a huge passion of why I'm making the thing. But there's, you know, it's multifaceted of why you're, I'm educating myself, I'm entertaining you, and I want to make features. So there is that strategic decision of how I ultimately make them that will hopefully have a producer see it and go, that's cool. What's the feature version? Yeah, absolutely. 12 years ago, you know, you're, I guess, 28 at that point, sleeping on a friend's yeah. futon, um, yeah. you know, and, and now you're you know, married, two kids, uh, you've come a long way, but has becoming a parent and a husband, uh, has that altered the way that you approach all of this? Cause back then, I mean, you were willing to sleep on a friend's futon while you figured all this out, but now you got mouths to feed. Yeah. So how is that, yeah. how has that kind of changed the way that you approach all this? Has it at all or totally? Yeah. <clears throat> Before, um, you know, I, I wish I would have changed this earlier uh, when we were just married. Um, but I, I was she I was working seven days a week. You know, a short day was 15 hours a day, legitimately. Yeah. Uh, seven days a week. Um, a normal day was probably, you know, 17 or 18 hours a day. Sometimes I would hit 20 plus, you know. But when my wife got pregnant, it was like, and you're done with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like. Yeah, right, fair enough. Yeah. And then, you know, my daughter came and you know how much that shifts your perspective. Oh, yeah. Like that just changes everything. And um, I've said it a ton because it's just completely altered my thinking on everything. But my wife said, when you're 80, you're not going to regret the movies you didn't make. You're going to regret the time you didn't have with your family. Mm -hmm. And that was such like a, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Rude at. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was uh, on and off for a while of me trying to figure out that balance, but then I finally did. Um, and it came to sort of the same thing as what I, you know, said before, it's just, it's come to a place of if one thing's going to be hurt, my, the possibility of me, you know, reaching the only dream I've had my entire life of making a feature, uh, if that's going to be hurt or if time with my family is going to be hurt, the features are going to be hurt. Mm. You know, if I have to decide, uh, features are never going to happen, but my family's going to be well taken care of. That's the one I'm picking. Right. You know, so there's been, uh, you know, quite the pumping of brakes <laughs> in the feature world for me. Um, <clears throat> cause I was going hard at it for probably two years. And then yeah. my wife reminded me you're doing it again. And I was like, ah, you're right. Cause you know, that window open the feature window. Open. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, the window's here. I can't miss it. And so I went real hard and it was, it was like a 24 seven thing again. Um, and I have kids and my kids are missing me and it's like, you know, that's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so then, you know, and you know, you got to work, there's no getting around that. Yeah. I have, you know, I'm going to be gone a lot of every day because I got to work. I got to make money to take care of my family. Right. Um, but then when I come home, you know, I'm not going right to my home office and getting to work on the features that, so, you know, so it's figuring out where is that balance that, you know, I could still pursue this while taking care of my family in the way that they need to be taken care of both selfishly and unselfishly, because I want to be proud of the job I did. I don't want to look back and be like, I wish I would have, Yeah. you know, with the most important responsibility I've ever been given in my entire life and will ever be given. Yeah. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for doing this, man. Uh, I've been, I've been yeah, following man. you for a while and, uh, it was nice to get some insight into, to your world and, and also to, uh, to kind of get my brain going on how to get my own stuff to the next step. Hopefully it did the same for people who watched. Sure. So 
Uh, sure. Normally, normally I say bye here, but it gets really awkward because we got to stay on the call. So I'm just going to stop the <laughs> recording and and avoid that awkwardness. <laughs> Bye. I want to thank Ryan for taking the time to sit down with me on this episode of Creative Minds. If you want to learn more about Ryan or Film Riot, all of that will be linked below. I highly suggest you check that out. And if you want to get your hands on the uncut version of this interview, just click the join button below this video or the link in the description and become a channel member today. Channel members get access to the uncut versions of a lot of my videos, as well as free presets, free LUTs, and the occasional members only live stream. It's only a couple bucks a month and we would love to have you. So make sure you click that button and sign up today. But that's it for this episode of Creative Minds. If you liked it, please let me know by giving this video a like. It really does help and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. <laughs>